Our precious Heavenly Father, thank you again for the privilege of meeting in the sweet and wonderful name of the Lord Jesus. Our Father, we just thank you for the ups and downs and the trials and the difficulties of life and that you are always faithful, you are always there. Thank you, Father, that we have access by faith and trust in the shed blood of the Lord Jesus, the giving of his life, his death, his burial, his resurrection, and his coming again for us. Lord, we thank you that we have the assurance of his constant care, his concern, his wisdom, his direction in our own lives day by day. And Lord, as we find life becoming more difficult, more complicated, much harder, our Father, to live in our time than ever before, in at least our own experience, we pray, Lord, that you would keep us looking to you, keep us in the book, keep us, our Father, to be strengthened by the, in the inner man by your power and your marvelous spirit. Our Father, we pray that it may be characterized by all of us regardless of the, the trial and the difficulties and the problems we face, that we will be characterized as people who really day by day, moment by moment, walk in the Spirit and do not fulfill the lusts of the flesh. Lord, we know the world is too much with us, getting and spending. We lay waste our powers, but you are there to rescue us. You are there to uphold us. You are there to lead us on to triumph after triumph as we trust you. Thank you for your promise. Thank you for your performance in our life as we trust you, as we talk with you, as we learn from your book. And we pray, our Father, that you would undertake for us each one as we face the issues that plague us all, the problems and the attacks and the aches and pains of living, as it were, physical and mental and emotional and social and, yes, even spiritual. And we pray that you would cause us to be raised up to grow in you and to grow in grace and in the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ to be the people you want us to be. Deliver us, our Father, from negative thinking. Save us from becoming bitter and uh, negative and critical. But help us always, our Father, to say the grace of God is greater and that you give ability, you give enablement for us to be more than conquerors through the Lord Jesus. So that's the only gospel, our Father, that the world sees is what we live and how we talk and how we behave, and we pray that it may be an accurate presentation. We ask, our Father, that you would undertake for our nation. We pray for our country, pray for our prime minister and his busyness as he flies here and there and does so many things, but we pray that the things that are accomplished may be according to your word and your will and your plan. Lord, we know that the only way an individual can know favor and blessing is by obedience. And so a people, a nation, must likewise understand your law that has been laid down in your word. And as we keep your law, we are blessed. As we break your law, we suffer discipline. So we pray, Lord, for our nation, our country, for all of our leaders elected in provincial realm, in local and town and village. We pray for our mayors and our people who lead us that we would be brought to the point of understanding we are, we are no longer able, we are no longer sufficient. We need wisdom beyond ourselves and we would dare to search out your way and your will and perform it faithfully that we would know your blessing in years to come. Our Father, we pray that you would continue to undertake for those on our sick list. And uh, we do pray for each and every life. Lord, we're at different stages of, of hurt and healing. And we pray that you would look after us and our loved ones in a very special way. We know that every experience in life is an opportunity to learn the lessons you would have for us 
make us to be good learners, make us to be progressing in our spiritual and our relational education with people down here, that we would be those who mirror the Lord Jesus Christ in all that we think, in all that we say, in all that we do. We pray, our Father, that you would undertake for these laid aside who are unable to be with us today. And we have been praying for them, name by name, person by person, and we thank you for the way that you have gloriously undertaken. And once again, we lift this dear little girl, Sammy, before you. We, we marvel that she is even alive after all she has endured by way of experimentation and treatment and care in medical circles. We thank you for the dedication of those who have looked after her and cared for her. And we pray, Father, that you would indeed, according to your wisdom and your way, raise her up to health and strength. Thank you for her conviction of a personal relationship with you and that this is the desire that you would have for everyone, whether they be doctor or nurse or medical helper of any kind. Everyone needs Jesus, and she would tell them so. Lord, bless her and bless her family. We think of the circle of loved ones that you have raised up to support her, and they are going through very difficult times as well. And so we pray for each one that you would undertake to see them through, to bring them through triumphantly, and that you would be honored and you would be glorified. And so for the unspoken requests that we would all have in our own way, we pray your blessing upon us. We pray that you would indeed take us through the darkness of the valley when we cannot see and we do not know, but you guide us, you direct us, because we keep our eyes upon the Lord Jesus. Bless us in our time together this morning and throughout the day, for we pray in Jesus' name, amen. I should just take a, a, a word uh, about last Sunday, and uh, in your bulletin you will find a, a little written message of appreciation, but uh, of course I, I do not know <laughs> of these times. In fact, as we have staff meetings and we get our bulletin and our week together and we have our plans laid out and who's going to do what and so on, uh, we think we have it all in order. And, when Erlita was provided me with uh, a bulletin cover uh, last week, it was entirely different than the bulletin cover you folks got. <laughs> In fact, she uh, supplied the bulletin cover which we have today, and I looked at it, and I said, well, yes, I, and I appreciated the message of it and just took it for granted because, and then lo and behold, there was this marvelous uh, pastor appreciation uh, expression, and uh, I, I do want to thank you all for your faithfulness and your love and your support of, uh, of this pastor. These are not easy days, and uh, in many ways we are, we are functioning with need, and uh, I, I really feel that uh, when my good wife was with me that you had a full-time worker, and now we no longer have the full-time worker in the church, and I have no longer the full-time worker at home. And uh, I have many, many responsibilities, and only those who uh, do uh, these things would understand. But we, we struggle, and we appreciate your prayers, and we do the best that we can. And we are here to help you as individuals, and we've been able to do that in many ways, uh, in uh, not only teaching and, and counseling and helping and so on, but we want you, every week we have in our bulletin uh, a sheet, and if you want to sign up and ask for an appointment, or you can drop by the office and make an appointment, call in, we are happy to help you any way that we can. We want you to know Christ and to enjoy the full and the marvelous life that Christ affords. And we need to be on the victory side these days. We will never survive all that is happening without a solid continual trust in God and in his provision for us. So thank you, thank you, thank you, folks, for all of your love and your kindnesses and prayers, especially that we might be able to uh, carry on and do the work of God, looking for the coming again of Jesus at any time. 
Well, we're opening our Bibles to Philippians 4 this morning, and we are continuing in uh, understanding how God is offering help to us in these days, difficult days, uh, hard days, uh, days in which uh, we, are, we are tried, we are pressed with regard to time, we are pressed with regard to resources, we are pressed with regard to responsibilities, and all of the things that come to us. But God is talking to us especially, more than ever I feel, that we really need to utilize the access to his presence in prayer. And we take it for granted and uh, we all uh, go through times of uh, very pressed circumstances and uh, shortages of all that we need or whatever, but uh, prayer is uh, the great source and we get through. Uh, We're not the only ones. There are great examples of people who have functioned in the the face of life with uh, shortages and handicaps and and difficulties. Uh, I think of uh, uh, people uh, who have uh, been faithful in utilizing what gifts they had. And uh, when we think in terms of uh, those uh, who were gifted in music, we think of uh, a great soul like Fanny Crosby. And uh, we think of her, and she was the victim of a medical error as a little child, and as a result, uh, went through her life stone blind all of her life. And it was one of those things that just happened and so on, and she uh, was a believer as a, a child, and she grew in her faith, and she directed her interests, her t- capabilities fully to the Lord's cause. In fact, uh, she is an amazing person, and uh, there is her biography uh, we very likely have in our library. If you do not, there is also the story of, uh, of uh, Fanny Crosby on film, and it is well worth uh, taking and looking at afresh because uh, the time in which she lived offered far less by way of assistance than we have by way of help today. But uh, she uh, became... Uh, blind, and as she became blind, she realized she was dependent upon other people and other resources. And we do take our sight to be very precious and all of our uh, capabilities as we live and as we exercise our gifts and abilities together. But uh, she, uh, in a world of darkness, uh, utilized her other senses, and her other senses became more acute, at which happens to people when they lose one part, they gain uh, an acuteness in other areas, and she became one who wrote music. And she lived in a f- precious moment-by-moment uh, moment time of fellowship with the Lord. She was inspired when other people read to her out of the book, and then she was able to uh, use Braille in the course of her own life in its early stages and uh, was able to read for herself. And uh, like a a preacher that I met who was suffering from blindness and exercised his gifts and abilities, I ran into him as a a boy and uh, he was emphasizing the need to memorize scripture. And uh, he said... uh, Scripture is so important, and uh, he said, I have made this a, a, a way in my own life. And, and uh, I said, well, the way you stand up and quote Scripture in the pulpit, chapter by chapter, is amazing. And he said, well, the truth is I have the Scripture at my fingertips. <laughs> and he was talking about Braille. And he did. He had it all there down, and he was a great man of the Word of God. Fanny Crosby was a woman of the Word. And in her faithfulness, she wrote over 8,000 hymns and choruses. Can you imagine that? And we sing many of them. They're in our hymn book and so on. There's not a hymn book that could could contain all of the pieces of music that she has written. But it was from the heart, and it still has meaning to us today, even though it was uh, uh, written more than a century ago. But she was a woman who said every time that she was to write a piece, she would get down on her knees and she would pray and ask God for guidance and direction. 
and she became later in her life so popular that people were saying, will you come, will you write words to my tune? I have written a tune and so on, and she was besieged and so on. And she was trying to work out her time frames for all of these people, and, and she would say, well, I must first pray. And she would kneel down and she would pray that God would give her the words to go with the music and so on. And in a number of cases, instantaneously, she would be able to dictate line after line, word after word, verse after verse, and do it almost without thought. But God would give her that gift. And so she made her contribution, but she was one who learned about the value of prayer talking to God, and asking God for what we need. Now, all of us, as we face life, I'm sure, you know, we are spending time in prayer because why do we pray? We pray because we have needs, we have circumstances, and uh, we try to work it out. When we can't work through these circumstances, uh, we find ourselves in great difficulty, and we come to God and say, I throw up my hands, Lord, please help me and solve this problem. In fact, in the fourth chapter of the book of Philippians, Paul in a Roman prison writes, and he writes with regard to the church in Philippi, and he mentions one of these circumstances that were plaguing the church in Philippi. Notice he says in verse two, I beseech you, Odious and Syntyche, these are the names of two women who were having struggles together in the church. They were fighting back and forth. They were at war in the church. It was a personal thing and so on and so on. And the whole church was impacted by this negative spirit, this critical spirit, and this unrest. So he says, I beseech you, Odious, and beseech Syntyche, that they be of the same mind in the Lord. And you remember last Sunday we talked about, and this was from Matthew 18, and it was the instruction of Jesus in that great chapter that dealt with prayer, how there was a necessity if we are to go to God and expect blessing and guidance from him, we must be what? Agreed. And what did agreed mean? You remember we had... Uh, Sarah come to the piano and she struck a chord that was disharmonious and it put your teeth on edge and it made you feel like you just swallowed vinegar and you're, you, it, was, it was just, ooh, and uh, chills up and down your spine kind of thing. And, so, and then to strike a chord of harmony and the difference between the two and how anything that is disharmonious, that's uh, really, I'm not happy with this, and I'm critical, and I'm not satisfied, and so on. That spirit is contagious. It's contagious. It reaches out to other people without you saying a word. It's written all over your face. It's written all over your behavior. It's written when you're coming and you're going. Well, what's with you? We need to be agreed. We need to be in harmony. Things happen, yes, but... We have the access of prayer. We have the access of each other. We can be honest with each other. What, is, have I offended you in some way? We can go to people and we can say, look, let's put this thing to rest. Let's solve this thing. We have just been through a study of the Corinthian church and that plagued the Corinthian church in so many ways. And so Satan is using his efforts today to do everything possible to defeat, to scandalize the testimony of God, and to turn Christian against Christian and believer against believer, to stir up problems as so that people say, well, I don't want to go to that church because they're having problems there. And some outstanding congregations now are facing court cases which are absolutely shameful. But Satan gets in. So we need to be on guard. We need to walk with God day by day. And we need to be humble about it. And so what he talks about here is that we should be agreed and of one heart and of one mind. And he says, it, you, when you come to the Lord in prayer, you're all consumed about the need. And it could be, it could be a relational thing with people. 
It could crop up in a family. And you say, oh, why do we need it? We don't need this now. And you try to solve it and work, and people become stubborn and difficult. And you know, the whole family is affected by this breakdown of relationship and, and criticism. It can happen in business. It happens in schools. It happens in classes. It happens with, with students in school. You know, they have fast friends, and someone said this about me, and this is in children and with young people, and they come home and they're all discombobulated and upset. And so, well, look, you do what you can do. And if there is a problem, go to the person, be honest, and just say, look, have I, have I done something that's upset you or whatever? We want to be agreed. We can make, humble ourselves and seek to make uh, reconciliation. And so this is a time when we are concerned about the need, but we also, in processing our prayers, which really is another word for preparing for prayer, we know what, not only what our need is, but we also know who our God is. And our God is a great, great God. He knows all about everything. He knows the, the little things and the big things, and he can put together what is so necessary and what is so needed in our relationship so that we come before God knowing that he is a God who uh, he doesn't need us to tell him what the situation is. He already knows. He hears everything. He sees everything. He remembers everything. He has a, a, a complete rundown in sound and in sight of everything you or I have done and have been occupied with in our own life. We do not fool God. And so we know that he is a God who is constantly reaching out and seeking us to come into harmony with him. Now, if you're not in harmony with God, and you're really having a battle with God over issues in your life, uh, he hasn't blessed you enough, he hasn't done this, he hasn't answered your prayer, or whatever it may be, uh, we know that uh, you're in deep trouble, and uh, you will not have a very meaningful prayer life. We understand we do have needs, and we do come to God, but we know who God is, because we have read his word. We understand that he is a God who constantly is there to help. And so as we study the word of God, we find that we are to have an attitude as we come to God in prayer, not a hopeless attitude. Why? All things, good, bad, or indifferent, work together for the glory of God. All things. And we look at them at various stages of the development of the all things and the problem, at the beginning, in the middle, or maybe even at the end. But if we wait it out and we pray and do what we should, God always brings us through and he brings good out of evil. And so he talks to us here and he says, you know, I want you, as you come to the Lord in prayer, to maintain, first of all, a stand fast position. He mentions that in verse 1. Therefore, my beloved, my brethren, dearly beloved, and long for my joy and crown. And really, the, the most precious possession uh, upon earth is not our money, not our bank account, not our stocks and our bonds and everything else that we have been holding, not even our uh, hard metal of worth and of value, gold or silver or whatever, and that's the great push today. What you hold in your hand, you really own. Other things can change and you uh, wind up with a piece of paper that's not worth anything. And he says, so stand fast in the Lord. The Lord is forever. And we need to say, Lord, we stand with you and for you and we're really seeking to be your people. And we stand by your word. And the world is drifting farther and farther away from the truth of God in all areas of life, whether it be in the uh, schooling of our children. And who can school children? Parents aren't to school their children anymore. You have professional teachers to do that. And what are they teaching? 
They're teaching a system of sexual education that is absolutely contrary to Scripture and what God would have done. Well, we say, we're, Lord, we love you. We love your word. We're going to do what you want us to do. And we will, therefore, stand fast with regard to the testimony of uh, the Lord, the word of God. In the past... Look at anything in the history. Can you find anything in the Bible of an historical nature that is erroneous, that is false, that is not true? Nothing, nothing. All right, that's ground for not only what has happened, but for what will happen. And we examine the prophecies that God has given by the hundreds and hundreds and every one that is to be fulfilled or has been fulfilled is according to record and it's reliable and it's true. God's word stands as truth. You do not need to change it. You do not need to add or subtract from it. It is totally accurate for the time and age in which we live and it will be truth throughout all eternity. So this is where we stand, standing on the word of God, and there is only one way. And I was uh, talking to some business people this week, and, and, and as I talked with them, and they're talking about the world and the election in the United States and what a mess the whole world is in and and what are our leaders going to do? And are their leaders, are, are they reliable? And uh, are they trustworthy? <laughs> and on and on it goes. And I said, now look, you need to know one thing. And that is, there is one person who is totally reliable. He lived among us. It is Jesus Christ. He is the only hope that we have in this world for our own personal growth and development and eternal salvation and in a world to come. You mark it. It's there, and he will come. He said, I will come again. And to share that with these people, and I was surprised. I thought they would mock, or do, and they, they, they listened, and, and they nodded their heads in, well, I don't know whether it was just agreement on the basis of uh, not losing a customer or whatever. I don't know. But anyway, the point is that was truth. It's truth. And we resound they and sound and resound the message of salvation and truthfulness in the word of God. So we need to be anchored in the word. We don't need to come to God and say, you know, I wonder if God is forever. I wonder if there are other uh, gods in this world. And now there's a great breakthrough in other beings on other planets. And uh, there have been a release of new information now that has been uh, uh, put away for more than 20 years now it's released and they say you know all of this about uh, ufos and so on it's true because we have records we have testimony we have this we have that and so on and so on well what do we use we say we are going to judge life and testimony by what god says that is dependable and we are truthful so we come uh, to the Lord in prayer, knowing who he is and what he's about and what the message is. We are going to be anchored in the truth of Almighty God and his word. Be of the same mind in the Lord, and if you're that, then you can help other people who are having trouble, and this happens to be a particular case between two women. Get them together and solve this problem, get them to be peaceful, to forgive, and uh, no, everyone has to forgive. You can't maintain a spirit of bitterness and hardship. It does more to you than it, by way of harm than anyone else. And then rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say rejoice. And even in our time, what, what can we really rejoice in? We can rejoice that there's a real God that he's given a real savior, his son, that we have sins forgiven, we have a hope, we have help right there, here and now. And as we live and as we ask God for assistance and we read his word and we seek to perform, God never has failed. And that is one reason why we have the book of Job, because Job went through so much. He lost every test of value 
He lost his property, that's money, his bank account. He went bankrupt with all that he had. He lost his business. He lost his family. Everyone in his family, sons and daughters, were wiped out. Uh, and uh, then he uh, even lost the allegiance of his wife, you remember. And uh, this was an arrangement between God and Satan, which we never knew before we read the book of Job. But uh, Satan is there, and God says, all right, you can put these people to the test, but I tell you, they're true blue. They're reliable. You can count on them being faithful. And, and Satan said, I can break this fellow Job. And he took everything away from him. And he stripped him down to the point where he lived on a garbage dump and he fostered around looking for his meal. Imagine a Bill Gates rejoice of, of, of a stature in life with money and billions of dollars and so on a garbage dump. And so with all of this, the extreme. And he says, in the midst of it all, Lord, though you kill me, yet I'm going to trust you. I know that my Redeemer liveth and that I shall see him in the last day. And his, his faith and trust in God was unshakable. And so rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. That is the one stable factor in our life that will not change. And then you be known among all people as people who believes in the Lord. And there are two senses here. You notice in verse uh, 5, the Lord is at hand. And the sense that could be interpreted here is, do you know that God is with you every moment, night or day? He never sleeps. He's always there. What did Jesus say? I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. That he's so close to you, you could reach out and touch him if you could see him. Well, we know that the Lord in his spirit lives within every believer, so he never leaves us. The Lord is at hand. But this also has a prophetic message in that the Lord is coming back. And when he comes back, he will take his redeemed out. And then there will be tribulation. Then there will be a false leader, an antichrist. There will be seven years of terrible, terrible judgment that falls upon an unbelieving world but then at the end of that seven years Jesus Christ will come supreme as king of kings and lord of lords and establish his kingdom and that will issue into an eternal kingdom forever and ever and ever the Lord is at hand he's ready to come back he's ready to knock on the door so he goes on to say be careful for nothing. Careful, do not worry about anything. Commit it to God and learn the life of faith. And we fail. We try to do it and we can't and we stumble and we fall all over ourselves here. But we recognize what we can do and what we can't do. And especially, we are not meant to be Lone Ranger Christians. We are meant to be helpful to one another. And especially is this true with older people who are retiring. We got great issues today. Health care facilities for retirement people. And how do they treat people? Well, you know, blame the government, blame the shortage of funding. We can't, we don't have enough help to look after these people. Sure, they're going to get bed sores. Sure, they're going to, die, they're going to become infected. Sure, they're going to die of bed sores because we cannot keep up. And then we have a current case, of course, which is to be com coming to the courts of the land. And that is a strange, strange situation. But the point is that God is able to do what he can do, and we are to be there to help in reaching out to these people. And we live in a terrible day where family no longer visits family members in nursing homes. People sit in corners or lie in beds day after day, week after week, month after month, and not one family member goes to see them. Well, I, wait, that's no fun going to see this old man or old woman. I want to enjoy life. I want to do this. I want to. Do we not understand that when we were younger, they cared for us, they looked after us, they brought us to the place where we are where we are today? Do we not have a debt to them? Do we not have enough love in our heart to say, 
dad, mom, grandma, grandpa, you know, we're sorry that you're going through this, but we're here. We love you, and we pray for you, and we want to help you, and we want to support you. We want to do what we can. And Christian people, above all, should lead the way in this regard. So he's talking about this. You see, this is, this is what God wants us to be as we pray. You can't just say, well, God, I got a problem and I want you to solve it. Well, what kind of a life have you been living? What do you believe about me? Do you understand anything about how uh, I have given scripture to educate you and so on? And if we do it right, we're not going to be people who are going to be worried sick over every situation that comes up. That's what careful means, full of care burdened. Be careful for nothing. Do not ever worry about anything, but do what? Pray about everything. But in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving. Can you not see a bright light in your life and give God thanks for something? It's always my family, my this problem, my this, my that, always harping. Is there nothing good happening in your life? Is God not doing anything to cheer you up or speak out of his word? Look for the positive as well. In everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, God, you've been so good to me. To be in Canada alone is blessing enough. Let your requests be made known unto God, and then you will have the peace of God, which passes all understanding. We tear ourselves apart, worrying about this and worrying about that. And Look, just do what God says. Do you know how big God is? That's what we've been learning here. Stand fast. He's a God who knows it all. He's here. He is able He has his plan, and he never will forsake you. It is always a good plan. And then as you work through this with God, you will have a sense of God's peace. And that's what we want. That's the greatest need in the lives of people today is peace. No peace. No rest. Turmoil. Upset. Argument. Fights. And the peace of God, which passeth all understanding. We, I don't understand it, but God, you've given this wonderful sense of peace. It's going to work out. You're going to do it. You promised. He always leads us in triumph, remember. Keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Finally, brethren, on the basis of this, we are not going to be people who are upset, and we're not going to be people who are constantly finding fault and being negative and, and, and counterproductive when we should be working together and doing what God wants us to do. We keep on doing it until he calls us home. And what is our lifestyle to be like as a result of this? See, this involves prayer, and it's prayer that helps us to see this. And when we have a problem, let's talk to God. You've seen the film War Room? And we'll show it again, but this woman who had a... a, a little closet and she went in here and she did battle with God for people and needs and circumstances and she laid it before the Lord and what did she gain why her thinking was whatsoever things are true whatsoever things are honest whatsoever things are just whatsoever things are pure whatsoever things are lovely whatsoever things are of good report if there be any value if there be any praise think, meditate, be occupied about these things not all the corruption wherever you have sin you're going to have corruption wherever you have an unbelieving population doesn't matter whether they're rich or poor whether they're in elected office or they're voting for somebody in office. But we're going to have this working out accordingly. Those things which ye have both learned. Have we learned anything in our Christian life and received and heard and seen? And Paul says, I'm really not bragging, it's all of God, but seen in me. Who had more right to complain 
about how he was treated and, and how he was shortchanged and how people would uh, criticize him for his, the way he looked and for his lifestyle and so on and so on. Here he is in prison and he's lecturing to us about what we should do. Yes, because he is on the victory side. You know, it doesn't matter whether you're in a palace or whether you're in a prison. If you're in the will of God, you're where God wants you to be and God is using you there and we accept that. That's what it's all about down here. It's all about God and reaching people for him. Seen in me, do, and the God of peace shall be with you. And so we see how this worked out. And Paul writes this, and he says, I don't want to bring myself up as an illustration, but it's true. And you remember in 2 Timothy, last letter under inspiration, when he wrote to this young man, and he's saying, now I'm going to hand the torch over to you. You're going to carry on, you know, doing the shepherding work and working with churches because now I'm ready. I'm ready to go home. And they're going to come for me and they're going to drag me out in the courtyard. And they're going to take that knife and they're going to cut my head off. And I will die a martyr for Jesus Christ. And I'll do it with joy because he's done so much for me. How can you argue with a lifestyle like that? And that is what we need to look at today because life will become more difficult. People will make it harder. They will become more critical. The day will come if we live long enough before the Lord comes when they'll close down our church for what we believe and what we teach. And what will we do? We will do what Paul says. We're going to stand fast regardless of the cost. We will be true to God because he has always been true to us. But the great place of peace and joy, as we struggle with all this, and there is suffering and there is pain and there is discomfort, is in the place of prayer. And when you get down on your knees and you say, Lord, just talk to him. Lord, you know what I'm, I'm going through. You know my problems and my difficulties. You know all about the need of help. You know all about this and that and the other. And, you know, only so many people can only do so much work, but we need more and so on and so on. And, and what am I doing to help? That's, that's the point. And so we say, Lord, this is where we are. But we know no matter if, if we are slain in the process, we're on the victory side and you're going to win in the end. So this is why we've got to do it God's way. We've got to pray. And when we pray, we need to sacrifice and come together. Because when people come together in one place, in the name of the Lord, powerful things happen. Multiplied power and working of God fans out from that prayer meeting to do incredible things. It's been that the testimony and the history of every great revival that you can trace, trace from Pentecost to our present day. So prayer, prayer, prayer. Oh, how we love to pray. And when you get up off your knees after praying and committing it to God, there's a lightness in your step and, you, and there's a joy in your heart. Lord, you're the only one who can fix it. You're the only one who has the answers and we trust you completely. So, Lord, help us to keep on praying. And as we pray, you will work, and you will be honored, and Jesus will come back and take us home. Let's pray. Our Father and our God, we realize that we are being uh, plunged into a, a fresh age, a time when people don't believe or support or endorse what we stand for and we just stand for your word and what Jesus said and what he did and so our God we pray that you would indeed cause us to realize just as we would go to the polls every vote counts every life counts I can always pray I can always if I know Christ is my savior if I have any sense of right or wrong as I read your word I can always pray for your will and right to be done. And may we do that, our Father. May we be faithful because this is 
the changing area of circumstances in our own situation and in your work at large. Bless us, Lord, to love you, to rejoice, because we are on the winning side. Thank God. Hallelujah for Jesus and his power. In his precious name, amen.